Why do we need microscopy? See, something we can't see by the naked eyes. Then we need microscopy. So when we talk about the microscope, it is in the range of micron, micrometer. So our eyes cannot see at the micron level or micrometer level. Then you need microscopy. So that's the light microscopy. If you further go down, go to the nanometer or atom level, then you need a more powerful uh, form of the microscopy that is the electron microscopy, where electron is the source of the energy, the wavelength. But the light microscopy can well resolve in the in the micron level, and micron level mostly this is used for the microorganism, the bacteria, the fungus, the cells that we are talking about, right? So when we talk about uh, our eye versus the microscope, in both cases we interpret that we are working with the lens. Our eye is a magnifying lens, but it has a limit. If you if you do not uh, 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 able to see within the limit, then you need the light microscope in the micron level. So when we talk about the, the limit, obviously there is a term which is very much important is called resolution. The resolution is the, the closest distance between the two points which can be seen, which can be actually rather observed or resolved. In the left side you can see these are the two points, the peaks can be resolved they are overlapped, there is a limit, and then these are not resolved. So it is like a you know, distribution, how much we can resolve and how much we can see. So light microscopy similarly is able to see uh, in the level of micron. So there are three mathematical concepts that uh, started in 1800s sometime uh, to depict or to decipher the, the, the resolution of a microscope by three eminent scientists. You must have heard about the Aries disk, then Abyss diffraction limit and Rayleigh scattering. By the way, the Rayleigh scattering, the sky is blue because of the Rayleigh scattering. The everything actually is scattered. We all know, we have read in our you know, school books at some point of time. So these three scientists play important role in developing the, the, the use of the light for the microscope. The first one, is the Aris disk in 1835. This scientist is basically was not a scientist but astronomer. He used to use the telescope to see the star. As you can see in the open eye, he used to see the star and then he found that the middle portion of the star is bright and there are some concentric ring around that. What are those rings? If you see, sometimes we can see hello about some stars or some of the light objects. Right? So those are basically nothing but a kind of a pattern, it's called Aris disk, that's a dip, diffraction pattern, or diffraction pattern. So in the middle, it is very concentric. When you go around it, you see the lights are diffracted and it, these are concentric ring. So if you look at some of the objects, you can not only see the middle portion, but you'll see some of the diffraction limits as it's shown here in this form. So that's the first instances where the Aris disks were introduced for the diffraction pattern. What Abyss did, it is in a later part of the centuries, 1873. It took long time to develop this kind of you know, Abyss uh, uh, configuration where the diffraction limit has been found in the Aris disk. This is very important that mathematically or numerically he has correlated this pattern of the disk and that's the diffraction limit uh, that D is equal to lambda by 2 Na. I will speak about the Na which is basically the numerical aperture after some time. So take my word granted that this actually uh, the distance uh, is dependent upon the lambda, the wavelength by 2 Na numerical apertures, so that he has introduced a kind of limit in the process of doing so. Otherwise, uh, the concentric disks are many overlapping, you know, kind of a diffraction rings. So you have to uh, limit them in certain aspects. The third part is the last part, which is the Rayleigh criteria. 
he defined there could be the well resolved the disk and then there can be just resolved and there can be non resolved configuration in the arrays disk that is very important for us to know so if you look at this a diagram you can see there are two peaks which are just resolved uh, if they are quite separated they are well resolved if they are overlapping they are not resolved so if it is not resolved we are not able to see under and uh, any light source or microscopy so these points uh, were clarified uh, actually you can see the two spots how they are well uh, resolved in the process so these three scientists give three uh, different mathematical formulas which i am not in putting it up here but continuously the process is developed and then it was the very beginning of the 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 process called microscope so once we know about the diffraction we know the diffraction limit now how we will see uh, and what kind of lens that we are going to use for the microscope so that's very important so most of the time we know that there are two types of lens we have studied in our in our in our, in our books at at some point of time in the in in the lower classes one is convex another is the convex concave right so it is the convex lens which is used for the microscopy as you can see over here it it gives a kind of a image uh, in the process and it is a very simple microscope i talked about but when you talk about a complex microscope it does not have single uh, lens it has multiple of lens at least two at least two one is objective another is ocular lens what we see ips so they these two actually are in parallel they further magnify the object and we see the image correct and you see the multiplication in the process that has happened object versus the uh, uh, multiply with the ocular lens and you get a final magnification of the entire process so it is very distinctive it is the law of the physics where the lens actually is the convex and there are multiple of lens which can allow you to have the magnification to happen and that is been used in the microscope so that's very beginning so we come to know about the the uh, diffraction limit we come to know what kind of lenses are going to be used now we come to a very important factor is called numerical apertures that is na so what is it it is a dimensionless it is the range of the angle that uh, uh, over which the light can be accepted or emitted right so this is very important part so all the lens is written with a not the objectives a 10x and uh, say 20x it has also written along with a numerical aperture value so that's the acceptance that's the angle bending and actually if you look at this simple form it is a, a sin alpha b by a one can easily find out the correlation na is equal to n is equal na is equal to n to sin alpha where n is basically the refractive index we are talking about refractive index of the air is here one as you go on the refractive index with the oil is more as we can see over here so if you look at this diagram many of the obje uh, objects that we see under higher magnification with the help of the oil why so why so it is because the oil has greater refractive index so you have na is equal to n sin alpha right your sin alpha is constant if you increase the n numerical aperture will be more so you can have a better uh, acceptance of the light you understand that that's what it is very important to have the refractive index and the numerical aperture value to be known and alpha angle is fixed in that process right so and it can be also change uh, depending upon the lens so numerical aperture plays very very important roles in terms of uh, the conceptualization of the lens so what we have studies uh, and understand so far is the numerical aperture which is depending upon, upon the refractive index and the angle uh, it's uh, the sort of the wave lens you have better resolution and the three conceptual uh, mathematical concepts can be introduced Uh, in the form of the lens so we have come to know about the lens numerical aperture we come to know about the diffraction limit 
These are the basic sub, you know, any microscope that we do. The resolution of the microscope, uh, the theoretical value can be found uh, at a particular, you know, refractive index uh, where n is equal to, that is for the oil, and this value is 0.17 micron. And that's the real limit. Below that, uh, one cannot able to see uh, by the, uh, by, by light microscopy. So you set up the limit of that. So it is around 200 nanometer probably in that limit of any microscope uh, in, uh, in the light sources. So these are all the, the concepts that actually been formulated. Now coming to the basics of the microscope, if you look at it carefully, you see uh, this is the part of a light microscope. You have an ocular eyepiece uh, eye where you can see. You have a stage uh, where you basically uh, essentially put the sample. You have a condensers and uh, you can see through the magnification of the objective lens over here. Uh, and this is the ocular lens. You can magnify and see that's the part of the light microscope. Now, what we can see, the biological samples, we can see uh, the fluorescence stain, if you have a, a fluorescence microscope. Immunofluorescence, we can see uh, when you use antibody. Fluorescence protein, we can also see if you take the fluorescence microscope per se. These are some of the, uh, the images. The DAPI stain the nucleus, you can see it. And the other, uh, the cell is dividing uh, the microtubule divides, that all also can be seen how the nucleus is divided, cell is getting also divided. So these are the some parts. The fluorescence protein, uh, one can make recombinant GFP protein uh, with a plasmid vector in it, and then fusion DNA construct can be transformed into cell, and the fluorescence of the protein can be uh, seen in the process also. So now, uh, coming to uh, basically the part of the microscope over here, uh, as you can see, this is uh, the animation video of a microscope. You have a light. Uh, it is coming onto the stage where you have the sample. You can see uh, the, the integrity of the cell in internal structure of the cells uh, by the fluorescence microscope. And then uh, uh, the, uh, the, the distinct color. As you can see, there are light and fluorescence microscope. The source of the, the light is different. Where, where in the transmission light microscope, the source is coming from here. This is the below to the top. On the other hand, the fluorescent microscope, the light source is here from the top to the bottom, and then it is coming back. So this the difference, you understand that. So the source of the lights are actually, uh, you know, are different. It's a fluorescent source and it's a light source, but actually they are different. So we can have a different kind of microscope, upright microscope. We have inverted microscope, fluorescence microscope, confocal. Confocal is the point of our discussion today. But let me uh, take you uh, to the root of other two microscope, unless otherwise you conceptualize the process of the nitty-gritty of the other two microscope. Confocal will be a little, you know, hard not to crack. So it is basically what we talk about is two type of microscope, upright microscope and inverted microscope. So upright microscope, the stage, as, as you can see, can be, uh, can go up and down. It is a motorized or it can be mechanical, okay? But these are fixed, the objective lens are fixed. This is the upright. And the space is limited over here. So maybe if you want to see some of the sample, the sample, uh, the, the slides should be very thin, uh, glass slides or some of the other slides you can see. But if you want to see the Petri dish, if you want to see uh, basically uh, uh, the, 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 ob, uh, the, space, the specimen which require more space, like the flask, like the tissue culture dish, so you need a different kind of microscope that is called inverted microscope. So in the inverted microscope, you have a greater distance over here. The stage don't move, stage don't move, but your objective lens uh, down there can be rotated, can be rotated, and then uh, you have a greater ground clearance, right? So you see uh, that actually in the process. So uh, uh, as you can see, the source of the lights are just different uh, versus the upright 
and the uh, inverted microscope. Here it is the bright field is down, bright field is up, and so the illumination also. So uh, the part which is very important in the microscope, this is uh, sometimes quite misunderstood, uh, is the presence of a dichroic uh, mirror. What is it? It is a made of, you know, uh, some of the materials that allow a threshold of the wavelength of the light to pass on and threshold of the light rather to be transmitted and threshold of the light to be reflected. So, so it is wavelength specific and that's allow the epifluorescence or the, the fluorescence microscope to work. So look at this here, if you have a, the light, uh, the, you have an excitation filter, it goes through that, and this is the, you know, dichroic mirror. So if you look at the green part, that is getting reflected shorter with the length of the light, and it hits on the sample. When, when there is an emission from the sample, it gives red, and it goes through, it goes through the dichroic uh, mirror, and then it comes to the emission filter and captured into the camera or eyes, right? So the mirror, it is allowing certain wavelength of the light to be reflected and to, fall, to be fall on to the objects. And then when it is returned from the object as an emission, that emitted light is of higher wavelength. They allow that light to be transmitted through this process and then it gets captured. This is another important part of the, 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 the microscope uh, uh, in the process, right? So there are certain advantage and disadvantage of the microscope. Uh, mostly it takes time, photo bleaching happens, the sample preparation is long, sometimes out of focus uh, uh, fluorescence are seen. So to, to, to overcome uh, this kind of a problem, uh, the confocal microscope is much more prominent. And today's time, this is very important to have a kind of a clear and a brighter image where you can see uh, through the confocal microscope. So what is the uh, challenges that have been uh, overcome by the confocal microscope? One should be able to know. See, the major challenges in normal fluorescence microscope is that if you look at the depth of a sample, the, the sample has, can be considered uh, into different layers of where the fluorescence can be seen. So if the light fall on the layers, suppose it is a biofilm, so basically uh, these different layers will have the fluorescence material and the fluorescence will start coming. But the light is falling in on a particular uh, layer. So the other layers where the fluorescence are coming, they are out of focus. You know, the focus versus out of focus. If there is an out of focus, when there will be collection of the fluorescence uh, from as an image form, you will see, you will see there is a blur image or out of focus image. This is the major challenge in the, in the, in the incon focal microscope. So those out of focus light, emitted light, should be cut off, should be eliminated. And the process of doing so is to use a concept called pinhole. It's a, it's a small slit which will not allow the out of focus light to come or to emit or to uh, be in the uh, trajectory. Only the particular plane of light so it come. By the way, the confocal, the name itself tell us that it has to be co on the same focus, on the same uh, focal plane, confocal, right? So coexisting in the same plane, not out of focus. So <coughs> here, if you see the pictorial part, instead of uh, one more important thing is that in confocal laser light is used. You know the laser is very specific wavelength. It has a high illumination compared to the other source of the lights, or the mercury lamp, which is used for normal microscope. So the confocal uh, laser, actually it comes through basically all the uh, the filters and then dichroic mirror, it falls on the objects and these objects, as you can see, it can have different layers, right? It can have different layers. This is the layer that we are talking about in the top where you want to collect the lights, emitted lights, the fluorescence form. 
The other two layers are out of focus layer, the red and the black. So you, are, you, you should have a you know, pinhole, which is a slit. When it, the light is going back through the dichroic mirror, the pinhole actually is the main obstacle. Is the main obstacle. It is basically not allowing the out of focus light to pass on. Only the, the plane of focus light, which is the green, is going out and you get the image of that. So one plane of light you are getting. So it is on focus, the image is very clear and bright and that is legitimate. So the another plane, if you want to see the image, I will show by the animation how it is possible to do. So you have to shift uh, the, you know, uh, the mirror portion so that you get another, another depth of the images, right? Now, with this idea, uh, these are actually the part that I have talked about, the light sources, uh, the laser, the fluorescence objects, and the pinhole. These are very important. This is, if you want, I can share the slides for you to read. But it's not me where I am going to read it out. That's not the good thing. So important part is that, look at the animation. Here, you will get the total view of the, of the, of the micro, uh, fluorescence microscope uh, in the process. So let me run the video and explain to you one by one how the confocal microscope work and what is the concept of pinhole and how the, uh, the images are captured. So let's go to the run. So that's the animation. You see, this is basically the plane focus Instead of the mercury lamp, we have the laser. That's the first thing. Changes from the uh, fluorescence microscope to the confocal microscope, right? Then you have the pinhole over here that is uh, uh, already shown. It allows only the green light to pass on. It will not allow the out of focus, the red and the blue light uh, to go through the slit. Because they are out of focus, they will be obstructed in the pinhole. So you get only the focus light in the process uh, of uh, looking at the fluorescence molecules. Now, you have a set of the components that I have written over there is the laser, dichroic mirror, and the mirror. This mirror can be twisted, and it can, can, can be rotated. So there is a mirror one, mirror two, and object. This is a specimen stage. When the red light is falling, the green emission is coming, and it is going through the dichroic mirror and collected in the camera in the process. The moment you tilt the mirror, the moment you tilt the mirror, you can move this laser into x and y axis. You understand that? So basically, you can get a footprint of the x and the y direction by changing the mirror, nothing. So on the plane, you want to get all the spots, so you get all the images from here to there, and then you shift it over there, and you get a, a tire of images, lot of images, lot of images, right? in the process. So you get a sharp image in, 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 when you collect with them. And then this uh, work in the x, y uh, directions. And also, uh, as you can see, it also goes to uh, construct the 3D images if you go up and down. So if you move to the planes, what we are talking about, so you capture the images, whole images from here, one, two, three, four, by the depth uh, changes with the, with, the, with the mirror, right? And reconstitute the whole images, you get, get a 3Ds uh, images, right? So that's very important. That is otherwise not possible for any microscope to get a depth of the images. If you want to get the depth of the images, you have to capture, you have to capture the images for each and every plane. And then you reconstitute all of them and get the entire 3D construction. So you are going X and Y, you're collecting all the images, that's give you the X, Y direction. Now you go to the Z, Z direction, up and down, right? And collect plane by plane all the images and then deconvolute them and generate the 3D images. That's, that's depend upon that. Confocal microscope, I am talking about the basic microscope of the confocal. There are different type of confocal, super resolution microscope is also part of that. So that actually get uh, better images by, uh, by, by 
uh, the better camera and other techniques also, and then there are two photons also. We are not including this because that's not part of your uh, the workshop. Again, these are all the things that is written down here. I will share the slide with you, and you are ha you will be happy to read. But I'm not going to read it for you. That's what I said. That's actually is written over here. Now, coming to some of the basic applications, right? So that application part is very important when you talk about the confocal microscope, right? So in the cellular system, mostly in the cancer cells, the cells actually are treated with the different dye or nowadays a potential nanomaterials to kill the cell to get a therapeutic index, correct? So a classical assay is done with a formagen dye is called MTT assay, where it is a plate reader base assay, 96 soil plates, as you can see here. There is a conversion of the dry, a dye and you see a color. So that color actually can be seen uh, by uh, your ELISA plate reader, so the index of the color. So the more the depth of the color, the more cells are dying. So you can get a you know, concentration versus the cell motility, the viability index like this. The cell after some time will die and you get a value called IC50 value where half of the cells are dying. Very standard assay, very useful assay, which is a uh, you know, colorimetric based assay and ELISA based assay. But the same index, can be also found by the confocal microscope in a different format, in a, in a image mode format. Let us see the live and dead uh, visualization of a cancer cells in this process. I will explain to you, the slide is very complex, but first you see what is written over here, calcin AM is a dye, which is an ester form of the dye, AM is the ester form, right? So that dye actually normally is a non-fluorescence dye. So if you treat some of the cancer cells with a drug and then allow the dye, calcium, calcium AM, to enter into the cells, there are a lot of esterage enzyme into the cells, inside the cells, inside the cells. So these esterage are non-specific. They will cut the ester bond of the calcium AM dye. So when you cut the ester bond, the calcin in, calcin in AM is now in the form of calcin in only, and that has a green fluorescence. So all the cells which is having the, you know, the color of uh, the green are viable cells because in the viable cells, the esterase enzyme is formed and active. The more the cell are dead, the the dye, uh, the, the green color will go down. Now, at the, at the similar position, at the similar position, if you use a second dye, which is called PI propidium iodide, which is a red, uh, which is give red color, but they don't penetrate the cells, so when the cells are intact, because there is no diffusibility, and the, uh, the structure is uh, larger. So, when the cells are getting uh, dead, the membrane, of the cell membrane is compromised, then only the red color enter into the cell. So what we see over here, uh, the lights are on, that's why probably it is difficult for you. You see the green color of the cells, uh, as you can see, at different concentration of the drugs, but slowly, slowly, when the cells are dying, you see the tinges of the red color appearing here. I can see my eyes is not as good as your eyes, you will be able to see better, right? because of the resolution, because of your power. So you see the red color over here. So if you merge these two, you see a red versus, uh, green versus the red. If you don't able to see, don't blame me, that is, you blame the projector or your eyes. So assume that you have a, the green and the red color combined, the cells are dying, you can see the quantitatively value of the images and you can easily see how much it is happening over there, right? So that is one instance. I say the 3D structure. When you talk about the 3D structure, the cells that grow normally 
in the lab these are monolayer 2d structure on the micro on the on the plates but it can be grown into the spheroid form or 3d form which is typically mimic the 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 growth of a cancer cell because in the body when the cancer cell grow they grow in bulk right in the spheroid form or it is it is like a you know tumor right so this can be created uh, uh, in vitro the cell culture condition in the laboratory can be treated with the drugs can be monitored uh, with the confocal microscopy what is happening to the cells so now you see this is the bright field images of the spheroid that i have shown you this the spheroid is like this multiple of the cells are accumulating and they are growing um, as a as a you know, spheroid right tumor so in the bright field images you can see these are the spheroid the staining with the calcinin am give you basically the green color right the pi in the normal condition will not interfere much a little bit of that little bit of that you see this merge image when the cells are treated with some of the drugs of the nanomaterials the green color significantly reduce because the cells are dying right the the red colors are introduced and then in the core you see the you know images of the red and the green color uh, together so the cells are taking up both the color so this is a very complex system this is a spheroid 3d structure so inside that if you want to power, see normal microscopy will not be able to give this much of resolution you won't be able to see that what is happening inside correct because you are not scanning layer by layer you see only one layer so the pi the propidium iodine may enter into the second layer third layer or fourth layer inside that 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 information will not be available unless you do the confocal and look for the planes and the images so this light dead staining uh, by the confocal actually will allow you to get a very good uh, and better images there are many more in the uh, i just put few of this see uh, this is one slide which is not part of the confocal microscope but it is also important uh, to study the migration of the cells when the cells cancer cells can migrate from one part to another part it's an event called metastasis so that actually happen uh, if the cells are in the circulatory motion and uh, they migrate from another part to another uh, another part this is called emt epithelial to mesenchymal transitions there is no point of understanding biology you understand that it is the cell movement what we are talking about but inside the body when the cells are likely to move they have to cross a lot, lot of barrier constrictions and lot of micro channels right this in the microfluidic system one such channel has been created with a collaboration with mechanical engineering students they have made a channel uh, where you can see the cells actually in one parts are appearing as a clamp if they allowed to pass through the channel which is a constricted portion then the cell has to be quizzed or deform otherwise the cell will not be able to pass through so cell should have the visco elastic property and they should be able to uh, deform and then to pass through that process so if we see this uh, uh, give video you will understand when the cells are moving over there uh, one by one cells they are passing through the channels and they are getting deformed and when they are coming out they are getting reformed right so they are regaining the size and many of the cells are dying but majority of the cells are surviving this is very important uh, uh, part for you know oncobiologist or clinical uh, clinician to understand how the cancer cell migrates to a constricted channel in the body how do they survive so they have to deform and then they have to regain their structure and that is possible to see in a microfluidics uh, devices this is very important uh there are many version of this uh you know fluidic channels because of the time 
because of the constant I am not pushing, putting. So lot of biological uh, interference, the cell, uh, single cell dynamics can be found out from this kind of uh, channel. So it, you, only you need very high throughput camera to capture the images and deconvolute them. And this is a good setup. Uh, now we have a phantom camera which can be you no know, upheld onto the confocal. I, I think Dipankar will agree on that. And then we can get better images uh, than this also. The all events, the live and dead cells can also be seen uh, at different portions of the channel, starting from entry to the exit in the middle portion also, where you can see the green to red, a few transition of green to red where the cells are dying, but still most of the cells are surviving. If you look at the left part, the survived cell, cancer cell, you see the part after crossing the barrier, majority of the cells are survived, few cells die. That's the challenge, how the cancer cell, metastatic cell in the body pass through the constricted channels, even they survive. We have uh, understood all the molecular mechanism involved in the process, all the signaling event in the process, because of the heterogeneity of the audience, uh, this may not uh, be the correct to put all the values, but I want to give the message that the cells actually are fully functional, capable of regenerating, and then it can again cause all the defects that they are supposed to do. So this event uh, monitoring is possible in the process to get the biological insight into the system. There is something called immunocytochemistry. Means you can see more than one molecule. Again, to uh, normalize the audience, I understand uh, the hiccup. Uh, so uh, basically, I will not go to the molecule. I will try to explain to you uh, what has been shown in, the, in these images. So immunocytochemistry means you use antibody. You an use the antibody or a particular type of protein that you want to target. That protein can have a lot of functions. That can protein have a regulatory role. That can have a uh, detrimental role. So you can use <coughs> antibody to find a particular protein which is appeared to be uh, green. By the way, this is not the dye that we are using. Dye, using dye and uh, subsequently doing confocal is easy than doing the immuno. Uh, cytochemistry using the antibody-based technique. It is the live cell where the cells are stained with the antibody, and that's how you see it. The DAPI stands for uh, the nuclear staining material. The nucleus inside that will turn around uh, uh, blue, and then if you put them, merge them to be together, you can see uh, some you know, blue and green color. There is a third party, which is another protein, at that attire, you can see that is uh, red, which is appearing over here. So you can see the green, you can see the red, you can see uh, the blue, all three. Among these two, uh, uh, three, the red is only the fluoropore, only the molecules which will stain the nucleus. The other two, other two are basically antibody. For two different type of proteins which are involved in...